Is she on? No, no, she can hear you. You're on? Good morning. Yeah. The inclination of his neshama. What does it mean to understand Torah according to the inclination of your neshama? We're coming to the festival of Hanukkah. We all know what you do. On Hanukkah, you light one candle the first night. And the second night, you light two candles. And the third night, you light three candles and so on. Why? <clears throat> because there's a principle in the Torah that we always go higher in things that are holy. You were, you're with me, Chaya? We always go higher in areas of Torah, holiness. Who says that? Base Hillel, the students of Hillel. Hillel's nature was expressed through the quality of chesed. We've learned there are 10 qualities of the soul. Each person's soul participates in these 10 qualities, just that some are more in one place and some are more in another place. So that one person can be very studious and another person can be very active. He's a doer. One person, you have a, a Yesachar who sits and learns, he's a scholar, and one person goes, uh, goes out into the business world and makes a fortune and, and pays all the bills for the yeshiva and supports the hospitals and the institutions of healing. We have a partnership between learning and doing. All this depends on the inclination of the soul. So Beis Hillel, Hillel and his students, their soul is rooted in, that is to say, it comes out, expresses itself through this quality of chesed, of kindness. And therefore they were very beloved because they were very kindly people, very tolerant and understanding. <coughs> but then you had the opposite quality. Good morning. You had the opposite quality, which is discipline and strength and restraint and measure. And that was the quality through which the school of, Be of Hillel's great colleague expressed itself. So they were always arguing because Hillel said, we start with one candle and add. And his colleague, his name was Shammai, said just the opposite. We start Hanukkah, the most exciting night of Hanukkah, is the first night. You waited a whole year to, for Hanukkah to come around. And now you want to light with a big trask, light with eight candles. And if the whole idea of Hanukkah is creating light and pushing away darkness, we're going to push away the darkness for good. The light all eight candles. What do you do the second night? One less. Seven candles. Because now we've already sent away the darkness. We don't need so, so much, so much great, such a great strength to dispel the darkness. Seven <coughs> candles will do the job. And the next night, even less. Six. What's the idea? Why do they, how do they justify such a thing? So, well, look at Sukkot. Sukkot, we start on the first night of Sukkot. We bring, what, 13 bulls as an offering. And the second day of Sukkot, we bring 12. And the third day, we bring 11. Until over the whole period of seven days, we bring 70. 70 bulls for the 70 nations. Each day, less. So each one has a place, each one has a, a precedent, a basis for what he is teaching. 
But the problem is, what happened at first, the students of Hillel did like Hillel said, one candle a night, adding each night. And the students of Sh Shammai said just the opposite. We start with eight candles and each night one less. So this was going to lead to confusion in the Jewish people that both of these attitudes are Torah attitudes. They both have a place in the Torah. But which, which one are we supposed to do? So therefore, how do they decide that? It, a very important question. There, there has to be unity amongst the Jewish people. Are you with me? Hannah, are you with me? Yes, yes. There has to be unity amongst the Jewish people. We can't have each yeshiva doing differently from the next. So what do they do? The, the Torah tells us, go by the majority. So they took a vote. And the majority of people went along with Hillel because he was a very nice person and everybody liked him. And his approach was an approach of Abbas Yisrael, loving and respecting and having compassion for others. And the approach of Shammai was very exact and measured, but it wasn't so warm and welcoming. It was very, very clean and pure and just, but it wasn't welcoming. So the majority didn't go with him. So th that so they decide according to the majority that the aloha for everybody should be according to Beis Sha Hillel, and even the people who were followers of Shammai had to do what the, what the Hillel said. And there was Sholem amongst the Jewish people, and s s families from the Shammai side made Hasanas with families from the Hillel side, and vice versa. And there was Sholem. The second way it was decided was in a heavenly manner. There was a voice that came out, was perceived by the prophets of the generation, and there were a lot of prophets at that time. There was a heavenly voice that proclaimed, Hillel and Shammai are both teaching the truth of the Torah, but the halacha has to be like base Hillel. So that's what it means. If we learn Torah according to our capacity and the inclination of our soul, you see, there's both these expressions in chapter four. And if we learn it that way, and we teach it that way, and we live it that way, then the whole of our being is wrapped up in the image of, the, of Hashem, which is in the Torah and the positive commandments and the negative commandments. Then we learned that love of Hashem and love of Torah is the root and source of all the positive commandments because by doing a positive commandment, we are emulating Hashem. We are making ourselves to be like Hashem. That is how we cling to Hashem. That is how we cleave to Hashem, how we embrace Hashem. <clears throat> we embrace Hashem by doing his commandments. And the negative commandments we learned are the source of all the negative, uh, 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 fear of Hashem is the source of all the negative commandments because two reasons. Number one, we don't want to, to be punished. We don't want to shake the system because if you try and cheat the system, the system will pay you back. The Torah system, you can't, you can't fool around with the Torah system. When you step outside <clears throat> of the guidelines of the Torah, you get into all kinds of trouble and you make trouble for others. And the second reason that fear of Hashem is the source of all the negative commandments is because a person, when he's aware of the greatness of Hashem, feels very humble and ashamed. How could I be so ungrateful? How could I be so foolish? How could I be such a yolt thinking that I'm, I could decide these issues that have already been decided by great people? And, and, and how could I be so foolish to think that Hashem doesn't know when Hashem doesn't care? Like we say in the, in the Psalms of King David, what is it, 94, I think. He says, if Hashem creates the eye, who, who makes your eyes? Who gives you the power to see? Where do you get it from? From Hashem. If a person, if someone can make the power to see, do you think he cannot see? 
Who gives your ear? Who, who, can, who designed your ear that you should be able to hear? It's a wondrous thing. Just ask any audiologist about the wonders of hearing. It's truly amazing. <clears throat> and the one who designed the ear, do you think he cannot hear? The one who came up with the concept of a video screen, can he not see what's going on in hidden rooms? And so on. <clears throat> so how can we think that we can outsmart the Almighty? We even say a prayer every day in, the, in, the, in, the, in Shachris. Please, Hashem, guide me that I should never, and give me strength that I should never be embarrassed. When people make fun of me because I'm Jewish or because I do mitzvahs, I shouldn't be embarrassed. It shouldn't bother me. But it means more than that. It, it not only, it doesn't just mean that you have the, the courage to, to act according to what you believe. It means also that you should never put yourself into a situation where for the all of eternity, after 120 years, you're gonna be embarrassed by the silly things that you did, by the foolish things. Please, Hashem, help me. I should never be embarrassed forever and ever. So this is a deeper understanding of what it means. Fear of Hashem will restrain us from doing negative things. And we also discussed how in this week's Parsha, we see such a good example of both of these things. How did Yosef, we read about this week, how Yosef was sold as a slave into Egypt and he was tormented by his situation because he was totally isolated from his brothers who hated him, tried to kill him and sold him into slavery. And then he was tormented in Egypt by this beautiful, beautiful, no, noble lady who was just dying <coughs> to be his wife and was doing everything possible to, to make him be with her. How did he have the strength to resist? He was all alone. He had no support group, no network, no friends. Nobody understood him. How did he survive? And the answer is, on the one hand, the, what we say, the positive way of doing mitzvahs is because of love of Hashem, because he was constantly reviewing the Torah he had learned from his father. That's love of Hashem. So since he was constantly reviewing the Torah, that gave him strength to withstand all the temptations. And on the other side, which is fear, of making a mess of your life, fear of going against the all-seeing eye of Hashem or the all-knowing <coughs> awareness of Hashem, that also enabled him to stand up in any test so that when she was pulling him down to her bed, he suddenly saw an image of his father's face in front of him and he couldn't do it, he ran away. And you want to hear an, ama an amazing story? I think in the city in the south of France, on the Riviera, Nice, in the city of Nice, there's a Shaliyah. I believe that's where he is. His name is Gurevich. And there was a young man in this town who was from a very wealthy Jewish family. And he was a kind of a socialite. You know, he had a lot of money and a fancy car and he did all kinds of, you know, he was a, re a really cool guy. And he started dating a non-Jewish girl from a, a very wealthy, prestigious family. And they fell in love and they're gonna get married. And nobody could talk him out of it. Even though it was a traditional Jewish family, they didn't approve of intermarriage, but nobody could talk him out of this. And the Shlia also couldn't talk him out of it. And he said, you know what? The only thing I can suggest, I've, I've given you all the reasons why not to do this and it doesn't seem to affect you. Let's go to the Rebbe and that'll be it. And he said, okay. And he had a lot of money, so I'm sure he paid for the tickets. 
And they came to the Rebbe and on a Sunday, they went by and he or the Shliach told the Rebbe that he's gonna get married in another week or two to this uh, girl. And the Rebbe gave him a dollar. I don't know what the Rebbe said. There are different stories like this in which the Rebbe said, did say other things. I don't know what he said in this particular case. But the Rebbe didn't tell him, don't do it. That's for sure. He didn't tell him, oh, no, you mustn't do that. He didn't criticize him. And he went back and came the day of the wedding. And there were two parts to the wedding. There was the religious part and the civil part. So the civil part came first. They, there was a whole procession in the main street of the city and they went to the city hall and the mayor presided over them. And after that, they were gonna to go to church and they were gonna do the whatever they do in church and get married in church. So they come before the judge and it's very happy. Everybody's in a, in a celebrating mood. And the, the judge says to the young man, do you take this young lady to be your lawfully wedded wife? Like I said it in French. And he doesn't answer. So the judge does a double take and he says, maybe you didn't hear me. I asked, do you take this young lady, this beautiful young lady to be your lawfully wedded wife? He doesn't answer. Now everybody's getting, starting to get nervous. What's going on? And the judge asks a third time, do you take this young lady to be your lawfully wedded wife? And he says, no, no, no. No. And the brothers of the bride jump on him and start beating him up. And he manages to get himself free and he runs away and disappears. And nobody knows where he went. Jumps into his Porsche and drives off. Nobody knows where he went. And nobody hears from him for another 10 years. They would kill him. I mean, to humiliate a, a girl like this on her wedding day. Terrible. After 10 years, I guess she married somebody else and probably had her own family. <clears throat> and he comes back to the community like an Orthodox per person with a beard and sits his, his observance not just traditional like he was, he became really observant, Torah Mrs. Jew. And the Shliach says to him, what happened? Whatever happened? He said, when the judge, I was going ready to go through with it. But when the judge asked me if I was gonna take her to be my wife, I suddenly saw the Rebbe standing in front of me. I could not say yes. So there you have the same story. In our own time, just like Yasef saw his father's face and could not be with the wife of Potiphar, this man could not say, yes, I'm going to marry her when he saw the Rebbe. And that's what it means that fear of Hashem holds us back and is the source of our keeping all the negative mitzvahs. He wasn't afraid of being punished. He wasn't afraid of being beaten up. He wasn't afraid of being killed. But he couldn't do it. That's what it means, fear of Hashem. Okay? So these are the garments of the soul, which what we say, what we think, what we do. <clears throat> We've learned that every person has two, two, two souls, a godly soul and an animal soul. The animal soul wants pleasure. The godly soul wants to cleave to God. The godly soul comes down to be in your physical body where it will have all these challenges because the godly soul wants something that it cannot get otherwise. And what is that? It wants mitzvahs. And the mitzvahs can only be done through thought, speech, and action. These are the garments of the soul. Just like you're gonna go shopping after the sales are over, you're, after the, the buying season is over, you're going to go get the leftovers on sale. You get yourself some good bargains. So the, the godly soul wants to come down into this world and be partner, partner with a body and with an animal soul 
in order to be able to do physical mitzvahs in this material world. Why? Bottom of page 81. Did everybody have the place? Turn to page 81 at the bottom. We're turning over to page 82. These three garments from the Torah and mitzvahs, even though they're only called garments of the, of the nefesh, of the soul, so which is higher? And the answer is, the garments are higher than the soul itself. That's why the soul wants the garments. You know, if you need a winter coat, who needs what? Which is high? Which is more important? You or the winter coat? And the answer is the winter coat. Because without the winter coat, you're going to be freezing. That's why you've got to get it. You're going to have to. If it's going to be snowing out, you've got to have a pair of boots. You're going to catch a cold. So these garments are very, how can we say that these garments are more important? You're telling me my winter coat is more important than myself? My, my galoshes, my, my boots are more important than my feet. They're here to serve my feet. Yeah, it's true. They're here to serve your feet. But you need them because without them, you're not going to have feet at all. So what he's saying here is that these garments are in fact from a higher level than the soul itself. And that's why the soul comes down here into this world to get them. Just like when there's a sale on at the end of the, after New Year's Day, there's a say all the stores have sales. You're going to run to one of these stores to pick up the sweater or the skirt or the coat or the hat that you need and that you want or the pair of shoes, whatever it might be. So the same thing it says here, because these garments of thought, speech, and deed are from a higher source than the nefesh itself. <coughs> How could that be? To understand this, you have to look into the Zohar. Who wrote the Zohar? Who wrote the Zohar? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Yes, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. The Zohar is the source of mystical knowledge that we have. What is mystical knowledge? It's knowledge about things that are not obviously apparent to the eye. Like the inner life. In you is your soul, and there's an inner life in the Torah. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai revealed this inner life in the Torah, or the soul of the Torah. Because everything has a body and a soul. The Torah also has a body and a soul. The body of the Torah is it's in five books, and it's written in a scroll on white, white parchment with black ink. And it's got so and so many letters, and each letter is made perfectly. That's the body of the Torah. All the laws of the Torah. That's the body of the Torah. All the laws and the holidays. What's the soul of the Torah? The soul of the Torah isn't the parchment and the letters. The soul of the Torah is Hashem. Hashem himself is in all these things. Where do we find it? In the Zohar. That's what the Zohar talks about. This is a uh, Shira, yeah? Yeah. From London. I don't hear it every day, though. <laughs> okay. So there from the Zohar, how, how do we know? Because it says in the Zohar, here we are on page 82, it quotes the Zohar, It doesn't say this anywhere in the written Torah. It says this in the Zohar, that the Torah and Hashem are one thing. And this is the basis of our understanding. And just like the Torah is one thing with Hashem, therefore the mitzvahs of the Torah are one thing with Hashem. And Hashem, with his, Hashem is one thing with his wisdom and with his desires, his willpower. Like you have wisdom, that's Chachma, and you have Ratzon, which is your desire, your willpower. And your willpower, that's you. You want to be uh, a scholar. You want to be a doctor. You want to be a lawyer. You want to be a president. Don't they, didn't we have a, a president in England who was a lady? And in Germany? and in, uh? A prime minister. A prime minister. Prime minister. There you go. 
didn't used to be, but I mean, we had a queen, but a person can't. We've had a number of queens in England. Some of them got killed. Anyway, but what a person wants, that's who they are. And what Hashem wants, that's who Hashem is. That's what Hashem is. What does Hashem want? He wants mitzvahs. He does mitzvahs. And he gives us to do the mitzvahs that he does. Just like a, a, a man has a business, he brings his son into the business and teaches him how to do the business. Hashem takes us into his business, which his business is making physical things holy. So the mitzvahs are one thing with Hashem. The wisdom of the Torah is one thing with Hashem, just like when you become wise, that's who you are. And so the Torah is the wisdom of Hashem. The mitzvahs are the willpower of Hashem. When we learn Torah and do mitzvahs, we become one thing with Hashem. How do we learn Torah? With our mind, with our speech, and we do mitzvahs with our actions. So that's how the Torah and mitzvahs be, are the garments of the soul that our soul wishes, because our soul is not happy enough in the Garden of Eden, so to speak, where it has revelations of godliness. It wants it doesn't want revelations. Now listen carefully. Your neshama does not want geluyim, revelations. Your neshama wants the real thing. You go into some of the department stores, in you know, the fancy department stores in Manhattan. As you walk in the front door, you're greeted with a wonderful fragrance. They, they you know, they, they, they make it very... They have perfumes and things to make it very welcoming. But that's not what you came for. That's just a fragrance. You want, maybe, well, we want whatever you want. Either you want the, the perfume itself, or you want the garment, or the overcoat, or the boots, or whatever it is you're there to get. You're not there for the fragrance. <clears throat> So what the neshama has in Gan Eden is a godly fragrance, but it doesn't want just the fragrance. It wants the real thing. And the real thing is where Hashem is. Where is Hashem? Hashem is in the wisdom of the Torah and Hashem is in the mitzvahs of the Torah. Page 82, third Hebrew lines. This means that since Torah is the wisdom of Hashem and the will of Hashem, and he is the Holy One, blessed be he. It is one thing, that means the Torah and Mitzvahs are one thing with his glory and his essence. His essence, not fragrance, but his essence is in the Torah and the Mitzvahs. And when we say he, what do you mean by he? So now the Alter Rebbe goes to a little bit lower level to make it something we can deal with and understand. And he says the thing about when we say that Hashem is one thing with the Torah and mitzvahs, what do we mean? What is Hashem? Look at the fourth Hebrew lines on page 82. Ki hu ha Hashem is the one who knows everything. V'hu hamada, and he is the knowledge. V'huli, and it says, etc. He doesn't finish the phrase. What's the rest of the phrase? He is the one who knows. He is the knowledge. He is the thing known. And he said in an earlier chapter, we didn't, we, we covered this. And this is in, not possible for us to, to comprehend what that means. We cannot know what it means. He is the, the knowledge, the knower, and the thing known. What does it mean? We can't know that because if we know something, so we can have knowledge, and then we can be the knower, but we're not the thing itself that we know. A person can learn medicine. A person can learn me mechanics. He can know mechanics. He'll know how to fix a car, but he's not an engine. He could design the engine, but he's not the engine. He can know how the engine works, but he's not the engine. We say about Hashem, he is the knowledge, he is the knower, he is the thing known. And this is how it always was. 
So that when we say Hashem knows something, it's not something that he acquires. Whereas we are born with no knowledge. We have certain inherited knowledge, like a bird knows how to migrate. A squirrel knows how to climb a tree. No one has to teach it. A crocus knows how to grow. When it gets a little bit warmer in the end of the winter, the crocus all of a sudden knows how to grow. It pushes its way up out of the earth. The leaves on the tree know how to make nutrition out of, uh, what's it called? Photosynthesis, the chlorophyll. And when it gets cold, the, the chlorophyll disappears. So the, the leaves don't look green anymore and they appear with their natural colors. Because <laughs> the chlorophyll makes the, tree, the leaves look green. When the, the tree stops producing chlorophyll, so we get all the beautiful colors of the autumn. And then the leaves fall off. These are things that the, the, each thing is born with. A cat knows how to land on its feet. Throw a cat in the air, throw a cat down from the second story. It'll land on its feet. It'll be fine. I saw a video about, uh, uh, you know, these nature videos that, that pop up at you about a, uh, an Arctic, was it a tiger? Some kind of a cat, yeah? Which, which attacked an antelope, not an antelope, an elk, attacked an elk. It lives in the snow. It lives in the snowy mountains, mountaintops. And they went off a cliff. They fell off a cliff and it fell 400 feet down. And he's attacking, the cat is attacking the elk as they're falling. And the cat lands on its feet and walks away, finishes off the elk and that's gonna, leaves it for its, to freeze and come back for it for its supper over the next few days. <coughs> So a cat is born with the knowledge how to land on its feet. We don't have that. But it's, it's one thing with it. But when we learn something, it's a knowledge that we didn't have, and we acquire it. So it's an addition to us. Our knowledge is an addition to, to what we know. So how can we understand Hashem, whose knowledge is from the beginning and even from before and, and ever after? His knowledge is not an addition to him because he is the knowledge, he is the knower, he is the thing known, he is the tree, he is the bird, he, he is the source of life of everything. So the Rambam says, this is what Hashem is. And we, this is impossible for us to even un, to begin to understand it. So how can we unite with it? Because when we learn Torah, our knowledge is becoming connected and unified with the knowledge of Hashem which knows every, which contains all knowledge. And our will, our desire to do the right thing is being connected with the will of Hashem. So that our will is merging with his will. And that's how we become one with him, which the neshama in the, garden, in the Garden of Eden, all it has is the perfume when you come into the store. But when you have Torah and mitzvahs, you have the real thing. And this is summed up in a metaphor. I actually learned it not in Torah, but you know, there's Torah in the whole world. And if a person understands something that's true, there's a saying, ain't el emes el Torah. Anything that's true is Torah. So when a person, there are common sayings of the ordinary people, and it says in the Talmud, the common sayings of the ordinary people are also Torah, because they're true. I'll give you an example. Here's a famous saying from the English people. Shira, can you finish this saying? A stitch in time saves nine. A stitch in time saves nine. You have a rip, sew it up quick. You won't have to make nine stitches later. A stitch in time saves nine. Don't push things off. Don't procrastinate. If you procrastinate, you're going to have more work, not less. A stitch in time saves nine. The wise person acts quickly. That's Everybody knows that's true. 
And therefore, it's part of Torah. So there are things that we learn from the world that are also Torah. And this idea that I'm trying to communicate with you, to teach you now, is an idea that I learned from a, a, a poet, which is that you have three things in the world of dance. Anybody here a dancer? Likes to dance? There are three things, Mrs. Yaffe. There's a dancer. What does a dancer do? A dancer does a dance. Is the dancer the dance? No. Are they two different things? Mm -hmm. who, who created the dance? He's called a choreographer, mm -hmm. right? Three different things. Now you go to the dance company and you watch a dancer doing the dance. What are you watching? You're watching the dancer? Or are you watching the dance? Or are you watching the concept of the choreographer? And the answer is you're watching all three. So we have the dance is the mitzvah. The mitzvah is the dance. And the dancer is the person doing the mitzvah. And the choreographer is Hashem. And they're all one thing. And that's why your neshama came down into this world. Because it wants to do the mitzvah dance. It doesn't want the fragrance. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Happy Hanukkah, everybody. No class tomorrow, no class on Monday. Okay. Light up your life yeah. with the Hanukkah lights. Yeah. And even better, light up someone else's. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>